name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Brethren in Christ, Laudato Jesus Christus. This is Timothy S. Flanders at the Meaning of Catholic. Today I'm joined by the Twitter dad himself, Eric Sammons. Eric, how you doing, brother? I'm doing well. I mean, as well as can be expected in 2020, I guess. But, you know, we're, <laughs> COVID, we're, all, we're all managing the best. COVID 1984 treating you well. That's right. Trying to. <laughs> trying You're still, to. Uh, still alive. Still the statistics. Still sane, but you know, on the edge a little bit at times. But you know, are they mandating masks in Ohio? They are or in my the... county. Yeah, they just oh, yeah. about a month and a half. Uh, I'm sorry, a week and a half ago or so. My county, uh, they mandated masks in our county. And there's talk of them mandating it statewide now. So, okay. Yeah. All right. Wonderful. Well, today is a, a very important topic. This is the beginning of a, a little more of a series. We're talking a lot about America on Meaning of Catholic right now. And a very important part of that concept is the economic question. And so today we're going to talk about the libertarian view, which is also known as the Austrian view, also known as free market. Any other words for it? Capitalism, good, I guess. <laughs> I, capitalism is a good name. It has been a good name for it, but it's actually so misunderstood. I don't actually like using capitalism anymore because people's conception of it isn't uh, isn't always consistent with what it actually is. So I, I like the free markets when I use. Austrian yeah. gets a little too... Uh, esoteric for most people <laughs> yeah and we could talk about uh yeah we have to talk about crony capitalism versus yes. free market too absolutely um but so what we're going to do here is so today we're talking about this this viewpoint within a catholic framework Catholic point of view and then on friday we're going to talk about the other uh popular view which is also known as distributism or aka uh Belloc, Chesterton, I don't know what they call that <laughs> other than that, but um, that's going to be Dr. Levi Russell's going to kind of present that view. Oh, great. And so today we're, we're, we're trying to get uh, the, the, we're trying to do a Thomistic, the Thomistic objection, the Thomistic analysis, which is where you try to make the best argument possible for every side of the question. So that's what, if, if, readers, listeners, viewers, if you want to investigate, especially something like economics, you want to find out the best arguments possible for the other side and each side and really weigh them. So, uh, Eric, before we get into more of the issues, what books have made the best arguments for you for this viewpoint? Well, I'd say the number one book would definitely be um, Tom Woods, uh, The Church in the Market. There's a new edition out. This is an older version of it. Uh, I believe this was originally a dissertation he did for a doctorate and eventually, yeah, there's the newer version of it. Uh, this is definitely the best one. It's academic though. Uh, so it's some heavy reading. You really have to get into it. That that's the best one. Um, another one is, uh, I don't have it on me, but you can download online economics in, in one lesson. I think that's by Hazlitt. Oh, now I'm confused, but economics in one lesson is a great one. Uh, another, that's a good one. Also, um, defending the free market. By Father uh, Sirigo, yeah, Sirigo, Father yeah. Robert Sirigo, yeah. That that's yeah. a really very good uh, simple breakdown. It's not you right. know, highbrow academic, tons of footnotes. It's just exactly. kind of a point by so, point. Definitely yeah. a good one. Another one. Uh, well, this one's interesting because most people haven't heard of this book, and it's not just specifically only uh, economics. But it's called "Selfish Libertarians and Socialist Conservatives: The Foundations of the Libertarian Conservative Debate." And it's basically a libertarian professor at Hillsdale College and a conservative professor at Hillsdale College. They each debate their positions and they argue against the other position chapter by chapter. And it's a great discussion done in a very uh, uh, non polemical way, but giving their arguments. What I, what's interesting about this book is, is that the conservative position is argued by uh, Dr. Nathan Schleter, who was my sponsor coming into the church, my roommate in college. And so he's one of my best friends, but he takes the conservative position. Of course, I'm more on the libertarian side of the debate, 
but it's a great book for that. And th it's more not just strictly economics, but just the idea. And I think it's it's nice because it that's the that's where I come from. Is I don't really have many discussions with uh, true leftists, liberals, uh, socialists, people like that. It's more conservatives that you're going to have the debate with uh, libertarians is, is, is with conservatives. So, so those are ones that I, I recommend awesome. those books. Yeah. So, and one of the things we want to keep in mind here is we're, and we're going to get into is trying to separate the essentials of the faith from the non-essentials of the faith, because there are, yeah. there are non-essentials where we can disagree. And so th there are certain economic things where we can disagree as Catholics and be good Catholics, but there are certain economic things that we cannot, there's no compromise on certain things like socialism. Right. We can all agree quickly on that. We're all against socialism, communism, all sorts of Marxism, completely against those things. Um, but these are a little bit more gray areas. Um, we are going to also, I forgot to mention, meaning of Catholic, we are, I'm working on a, uh, a debate as well on this topic. So we'll have a back and forth. Um, so I, I asked Sam Gregg, that one of the heads of the Acton Institute, what are the best books that defend this position? And he said, also, Catholic teaching in the market economy, which has Tom Woods and Robert Sirico and Sam Gregg on it. And also Michael Novak, Spirit of Democratic Com Capitalism. Um, the counterpoint is provided by Ferrara. He actually goes against Woods particularly. So that's actually written against Church in the Market in particular. And then this big tome for me, Michael Jones, Baron Metal, is more of a historical approach, which tells a lot of the story. Um, so those are some great books. Like I said, if you want to know something, you have to look at all the objections and really thoroughly digest them, understand them from their own viewpoint. So uh, without further ado, uh, Eric, let's talk about what is libertarianism. Okay, well, first I, I want to... Before I answer that question, the, you named this, uh, this discussion Catholic libertarianism, uh, and I would object to that first in that I don't think there is any such thing as Catholic libertarianism. I would say that I am a Catholic and I hold certain opinions on what I think is the best but not necessarily perfect political systems to advance human flourishing, and human flourishing can be defined in many ways, of course, and of which I would argue that none of them are contrary to any infallible church teaching. So the reason I, I make that point first off is that many people, when they hear the word libertarianism, they almost treat it like a religion. And therefore, if it is a religion, it would be contrary to Catholicism and you can't, and they're incompatible. But what I would argue that libertarianism is, is much more a view of how political systems should be organized so that people uh, can flourish. And by flourish, I personally mean uh, in a moral way, in a way that, that advances the Catholic faith, in a way that glorifies God. So that being said, libertarianism, I think probably the, the most basic way to def that I would define it would be applying what's called the non-aggression principle, which is the idea that no person can initiate violence against another person. And I would argue that that is a Christian, uh, a fundamental Christian principle. You cannot initiate violence against another person. And by initiate, that's very important that I, I say that because no one that's not pacifism, you can use uh, violence in defense, self-defense, defending your family, defending your country, whatever the case may be, but you may not initiate violence. And that's a very fundamental point because a libertarian would apply that not only to individuals, but to groups and even to governments, that a government cannot initiate violence. Now, what happens is when you start taking that to uh, its logical conclusion, you start to realize that every law, every law that's ever existed implicitly has a threat of violence behind it. Because think about it. If the government always says, okay, here's a law. If you don't follow it, what's going to happen? Well, you'll get, uh, maybe you'll get a fine. What if you don't pay the fine? You'll probably get arrested. What if you refuse arrest? Eventually, somebody's pulling a gun out on you. And so, logically, every single law has this threat of violence. And so, that's why I would say that the basic principle is laws 
therefore, should be only in effect when they are protecting people from violence, either threatened or real or against their person or property. So as you can see, that limits government pretty radically by modern standards. And one thing that that also I want to make sure I, I make clear is the general term libertarianism has a pretty broad spectrum these days. And so there would be libertarians who would disagree with even my point that there can be a government that could enforce any laws. I and mean, they're basically um, anarchists, anarcho-capitalists. And then there are other libertarians who, who, who call themselves libertarians, but they would probably give government more uh, authority than I, than I just did. So for me, though, that's where I fall. And that's usually called like a minarchist position. I, I do believe that there is a place for government but that it should basically, in general, be limited to protecting people from violence against them, uh, either against their person or property. And note, again, though, this is a political philosophy. This is an idea of how do we order society politically. It is not a personal belief system no, in the sense of like a religion. Notice, I didn't say anything in that about what people should do. That, for example, that you should... Uh, 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 stay um, faithful to your spouse, for example, or something like that. Those are things people should do. But whether or not political philosophy enforces those things, that becomes the separate question. Another point I want to make is there is, of course, the Libertarian Party today. That's a third party. Uh, and obviously by the name, it's going to be associated with libertarianism. But the Libertarian Party, its platform isn't necessarily what every what we call small l libertarians might necessarily uh, believe in. And so just be, if you go and see like the political platform for the Libertarian Party, I don't necessarily support everything on that. And most libertarians might not, or they may. It's probably closer to what most libertarians think than, for example, the Democrat or the Republican uh, platform. But let's not confuse the two. There's, there's a difference between them. And then the last thing I want to say, just in kind of defining libertarianism, and I kind of gave a little bit of a hint before, it's not libertinism in that be, being a libertarian means that you endorse being a libertine. You can be a libertarian and strongly, strongly believe in living a Catholic moral life and how important that is, and that you might believe very strongly that you personally need to live it and other people need to live it. And so just because a libertarian might think something shouldn't be illegal doesn't mean they think it's moral. And that is part of the Catholic tradition. I mean, there's the famous, uh, pretty famous, I would say, uh, argument made by St. Thomas Aquinas himself that prostitution doesn't necessarily have to be made illegal. It's not, it's not required that it's made illegal, be, even though obviously St. Thomas would say it's very immoral that the state does not necessarily have an obligation to make illegal. And of course, we all actually think this. We None of us would say that every single thing that's immoral should be illegal. If you lie to uh, a stranger, they shouldn't lock you up for that. Or if you, you know, th there's different things you can do that we would, you and I, as Catholics, would consider immoral, but we don't think the state should make it illegal. And so just because you uh, believe that the state should not enforce certain uh, morals does not mean that you're uh, that you that you embrace those as good and and something that is healthy. It's a matter of more a practical consideration of what is best for human society to for a government to enforce and what is best for them to allow to occur legally, even though it's not something that's good for a person to do. It's never good to lie, for example but doesn't mean you should be arrested for it. That I think that would yeah. be my overview of, okay. of liberty. Yeah, so I my understanding is that, uh, I believe it was Ludwig von Mises. I yes. can't remember his first name. Ludwig. Yeah, Ludwig, Ludwig, yeah. Okay, um, so von Mises and Rothbard, mm -hmm. the two 20th century theorists of the yes. Austrian school. Yeah, they're giants of the... In and, the in yeah, Austria. they're basically yeah. the godfathers of this, this viewpoint yes, in the 20th century. And they theorized that there are basically sort of the two commandments 
again uh, of uh, that which the government's supposed to do basically preventing violence and pre preventing theft those right. two things and they they believed that if they just prevented those two things and kind of limited everything else then everyone is that kind of your your viewpoint eric that i what i would say is down to that? that what i would say is and here we get into an important point i would say those are the two primary and perhaps even only role of government and two things about that number one is i don't think there's a such thing as a utopian society on earth that's possible and that's because of original sin and so what i'm looking for is what do i think is the best political system to allow human flourishing not the one that will prevent all sin or anything of that nature and so because original sin is going to exist in any political system and the best society is going to be the one in which the people are choose to be moral that they choose that, that, that they're they're practicing catholics i mean that's really going to have your best society and in fact i would even argue that if your society consists of practicing catholics it almost doesn't matter what political system you have because people are going to choose to do the right things so but i would say that this view of a very limited minimal government that protects people against violence uh, and theft those are and theft would include things like fraud and, and violence is is can include a number of different things and we'll get into that i think later that's a that's probably the best human system to allow that and i feel like this is where this view really takes in consideration original sin and by that the fact that original sin impacts every single human being save our lord and our lady of course including government officials. And I think this is where I really have uh, uh, an issue with a lot of those who are politically conservative. I mean, I'm personally conservative in how I live, but politically conservative in that once you start giving men and women authority over other men and women, you have to realize that they have more power to abuse their original sin than if they don't have that authority. And so the more limited authority they have, the less they can abuse original, you know, use original sin to abuse that authority. And so by not allowing them to uh, have authority over you, except for in a very limited situations in which they're protecting you from other people abusing uh, your, your rights, your, your ability to uh, live freely, I think that's going to be your best situation because we see that in history, particularly the 20th century is a great example of that where in the 21st century, we're seeing it as well, that you have these governments with this great authority, the Soviet Union being the most explicit example, uh, Nazi Germany, places like that, they can control and they, they, they prevent you from living out your faith. And I'll be honest, I think we're seeing that in 2020, that you see the governor of California has shut down all churches by fiat. He has no, I mean, he just basically said, it, and he says for the common good. And now anybody listening who is very much believes that COVID-19 is a, 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 ramp, a pandemic that's rampaging, I'm not going to, I'm not trying to argue that point. I'm just saying that the fact that a single man can tell millions of people you can't go to church by just simply stating it and signing a piece of paper that's dangerous and that's not that's not a good thing and and so that's why a minimal government would not allow that a, a, a more a more just government would not allow that and so i feel like in today's world particularly we're seeing that the abuse author authority leads to uh, our inability to practice the faith and, and live in a way that Christ wants us to live. Yeah, I don't, I don't think anybody can disagree with the. I mean, I guess I guess there are pro-life Democrats out there, so not to knock you, but uh, the big government idea is is very much agreed upon. At least the the this you know the the NSA state that we have now, right? Uh, it is, and the Republicans beyond, support that too, uh, in a lot of ways. Right. Yeah, and, and but I think that many Catholics would. Would I mean, especially with COVID nineteen eighty four, be objecting to the the insanity of the state at this point? 
here's here's a question with that because it, I think you make a good point about the original sin affecting the officials. Now, what about and you, this might get into talking about about the free market now, but what about making laws because the government is supposed to enforce the laws, which are supposed to be at least objective in that everyone needs to follow them, including the government. Um, does does making laws help the original sin of the populace? Yes, I think there, and I do think there are uh, certain laws that are just and good. I mean, for example, we've already talked about them, laws against violence, against uh, fraud and theft. So for example, obviously laws against murder. That's why, I mean, one of the thing I want to get out of the way is it's well known that many people call themselves libertarian, believe that a woman should be able to kill her uh, child in the womb. And there's just two things. Number one is there's lots of people who call themselves libertarians who don't think that. Ron Paul, who's probably the most famous libertarian uh, in America today, he's very, very pro-life. Um, but that would be a law, a law against abortion, in my mind, is a very follows from libertarian principles that you can't commit violence against another initiate violence. Well, if there's, I mean, if there's one thing that's initiating violence against somebody, it's, it's uh, killing a child in the womb. And so obviously there's certain laws that I think do control the original, uh, uh, not control original sin, that's not, right, not the right word. Curb at least. Curb. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and prevent us from it. So I definitely, I mean, and you'll hear some people say like libertarians, some people will say that, uh, you can't legislate morality. And that's liberals say that, of course, too. But I'll hear libertarians say that sometimes. And I don't, I don't think that's true in that there are laws. People do uh, act in conjunction with laws. Often it can curb their desires. But what I'm saying is, is that we have to find that balance between laws that are protecting us from others violating our ability to live uh, through violence, through theft, through fraud, things like that. And laws in which it's simply uh, authoritarians controlling our lives and telling us how to live in a way contrary to uh, the way we want to, but more importantly, contrary to the gospel. And so there's got to be that balance and there has to be a line drawn somewhere. And so as a libertarian, I would definitely draw that line as close as possible to Anything that is not uh, laws would only would restrict to only things that are against violence, against uh, theft, against fraud, things of that nature. Violations against somebody else's ability to, uh, you know, flourish. I guess. And, and the word flourish, I know, is a very generic word, but I use it purposely because I do think that it can be defined in different ways, but it can be defined in a way that I think you and I would both agree with of uh, flourishing which is living a, a Catholic life. Okay. And so let's get in, because it sounds like the my understanding of the libertarian position is that the limited government is particularly so that there can be as free of a market as possible. Yes. And, and that, yes. And, it, and here's another, and I, we're talking about, we're going to be talking about economics a lot, but the one thing people always act, you hear criticisms against, libertarianism as if they're only focused on economics, on money, and human beings as economic agents only. The problem is, is that we don't understand what the word economics means, what economy means. Economics is basically the human choices we make. In fact, there's uh, one book I forgot to mention is uh, by Robert Murphy, and it's called Choice, which of course for us Catholics, as soon as we hear that word, we, we like, uh, because obviously the pro-choice movement, pro-abortion mm -hmm. movement has taken it. But this is basically a, a layman's guide to one of Mises's, like one of Mises's books, Human Action. But the point is economics is simply the exchanges we have all the time in society. And so it might include going to the doctor and receiving medicine. That's an economic exchange. It might go into the store and buying coffee is an economic exchange. But so is working at the soup kitchen and giving, uh, giving out free food to the homeless. That's an economic exchange if you understand the word economic properly. And so what government 
limited government's trying to do is it's trying to allow for voluntary economic exchanges. And those voluntary economic exchanges means the person, the individual, the family even, is allowed to make these choices that are best for them as long as they're not violating the choices of uh, the free choices of others through violence, through theft, through fraud, uh, things of that nature. And so it's not a matter of libertarians are focused on money. I, in fact, I, my libertarian beliefs came to me very, had very little to do with uh, like getting rich or anything of that nature. It, it wasn't really related to that at all. It was more a matter of, okay, how can people live in a way that's the most free so they can be most free to worship God? And so, yes, when we talk about economics, a big part of that is the free market, but the free market, again, isn't, isn't reduced to just uh, monetary exchanges. And so, therefore, the free market is something that limited, that limited government would uh, very much support as free and voluntary exchanges as possible. Because really, that's what it comes down to is the free market is simply the ability to have voluntary exchanges in society instead of having a limited group of people dictating what a large group of people, the, the, the um, exchanges are allowed to have. Yeah. I think uh, Sirico does a good job in defending the free market of, of just talking about economic exchange, which I think everyone, whether you're libertarian or not, can agree that just being able to have an economic economic exchange will allow trading and the cooperation and sharing, basically, of these different goods that we have, and everyone benefits from that. Just, just on, on a without talking about the government or these other issues, I think it's it's easy. I think for when we look at sort of the basics of an economic exchange, everybody has to have economic exchanges to live. Every right. family has to do economic exchanges. You have to do that. It's a part of life. And the more free you are to actually do that freely to provide for your own needs, the more people are able to benefit. At least, I, just taking away all these other issues for one moment. And just sort of looking at economic exchange itself and realizing that you do need to do that and it is a good thing. Right. And I don't have, I, I admit, I don't have like, the numbers in front of me, the studies in front of me. But I I know that if you look at the history, uh, the countries over time who have had the freest markets have also had the most economically prosperous markets in, in a sense of, if you think about Living in, well, let's not use 2020, let's use 2019. Um, <laughs> you think about living in 2019, how many people, what, is the, what do we consider poverty? Somebody in poverty today in America, which is, I would argue is not a true free market, but it's closer than almost any other country in, in the history of the world has been. Somebody living in poverty probably has a cell phone and a big screen TV. I'm not saying those things are bad or good things. I'm just saying, though, they cost money. And is able to uh, live at a level that, frankly, somebody in 1700 would consider luxurious. And that is because of the free market. And that is because there's been a more freedom of exchanges. I mean, it, it, it's been shown study after study that the freer a market is, the more people are able to uh, provide for their needs. And before somebody argues uh, i've heard catholics argue this like basically you're just saying then you just want people to be rich and like rich is the best thing no i am saying no that destitution is is a bad it is an evil that we want to try to overcome we don't want people in destitution we want people and the church has said this that they want people to be able to uh, provide for their needs and yeah there are downsides to being rich. I mean, our Lord talked about directly said that being rich is a danger, but at the same time, not being able to provide for your family, not being starving to death, or, or I think a better example is our medical situation. The free market or a freer market has done wonders for developing the medical field so that we can live a much healthier and longer life. We don't have babies dying in free markets at birth 
or at one or two. I mean, you go in the history of the world, you have people dying very quickly. Well, that's, that's frankly, that's the free market that's allowed that to happen. That we have, it's a tra it's always a tragedy, but it's a rare, very rare tragedy now for a baby to die in or a woman or a mother to die in childbirth, whereas it was commonplace centuries ago. And that's because of advancements in medical technology. And that's because of the free market that that's happened or a freer market. And so this isn't just about, okay, a free market so people can, the rich can get rich and the poor can get poor or whatever. It's so that that's part of human flourishing is the fact that we can live healthier, longer lives. That's a good, that's not something that Catholics should be, uh, embarrassed about or think it's not, a, it, it's an objective good for people to live longer and to uh, be healthier. And that's something that we yeah. thankful that, that we thank the free market for. Yeah. So well, since you brought up the history, uh, this is where one objection arises. And that is discussing the, the history and the disputed history of the, of the industrial revolution, because the, the history that this is what, like this is coming from Ferrara and E. Michael Jones, for example. So the history goes back to really the Reformation when the the masses of amounts of church property was taken away from. It was basically the beginning of big government, which you, <laughs> I mean you'll agree with that because yeah. before that was it was a great deal of subsidiarity. It was far more limited monarchy. You know there were these towns and villages, and as as we'll all we'll all admit there was a great deal of famine and starvation and disease and child mortality and all these difficulties, but there was also burgeoning science since Albert the great back in the 1200s and science was developing still at that point. So it's, it's difficult to assert that it was uh, the causality of the free market caused science. We, I mean, I don't think you're inserting that, but um, science was developing, but the progression of the revolution since the taking of the church property away from the poor really and putting it in the hands of oligarchs and the growing government like henry the eighth and then the enclosure movement which is just taking more land and forcing people into basically concentration camps and then they're in a situation where they have no choice but to go to the factory or they're forced in the factory they're either forced or they have no choice and so this is something that Woods argues in Church of the Market, um, but he doesn't go back far enough to talk, talk about the whole history. And so that's, I think, the, the difficulty with um, the objection I think that is raised is, yes, we can agree that the free market or certain economic exchanges provided for indoor plumbing and a great deal of luxury, but it also provided for the worldwide pornography industry, abortion industry, contraception, to the point where people are despairing and they're less happy, one might argue, and less spiritual. And so more souls are perishing in eternal damnation. And so it's it's a classic case of when our Lord says, what, what, what good it would do to gain the whole world but lose your soul. So that's a big, I think that's that's one of the big objections to that argument. What do you think about that? Well, a couple things. First is, I mean, something like what Henry VIII did, I mean, that is the prototypical big government anti-libertarian action because he stole from people. I mean, he stole from the church, he stole from individuals, he stole from the poor. And so there is a classic case of violating the, the um, fundamental principle of libertarianism that he, 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 violated the non-aggression principle. He in, in, um, initiated violence against people. And so that would be something that obviously would be anti-libertarian. I think the argument, it's an argument I'll, I, I will admit that I've thought of myself and I'm, I haven't, I, I don't come to a strong conclusion one way or the other, the idea of the development of free markets, more free markets, the advance of technology there is no question that the advance of technology has been both a good and an evil in this world but to me i still would argue that technology in of itself in general is amoral in the sense that the technology that was used to develop 
the ability for babies to survive longer in, in situations in the womb where they wouldn't have been able to survive before also allows abortions to be uh, easier and more readily available. The same type of technologies, you know, ultrasound, things like that. And so the question is, is the world better with or without that technology? And I would argue it's hard to say that you can blame the advancement of technology for these things because in a sense, it's just like, are you just saying, well, original sin is, is amplified by technology? Okay, but so is human suffering. A lot of it is uh, reduced by technology. And so it's like the classic case of a knife. The better the knife is, the better you can cut your carrots. And also the better you can cut somebody's throat. And so it seems to me that you can't, and this is a, a fundamental principle, I think, of libertarianism, is that what people do with the freedom they're given is not fundamentally what libertarian it, libertarianism is answering. That's what religion is for. That's what Catholicism is for, particularly the true religion, Catholicism what they do with that freedom. And so if people use the, the, the advances of technology that gives them more freedom, more ability to help others to make things worse, then that's not an argument against libertarianism. That's just an argument that original sin still exists. And so the more technology we have potentially the, the, but the, the, we're going to have these evils become more prevalent, but technology has been developing since the beginning of time. Cain, Cain wasn't able to kill Abel as easily as we're able to kill our neighbor today. He had to use probably a rock and he had to really work at it to kill his brother. Today, I can just get a gun and do it real easily. Are we going to say, obviously, it, or even, or should we ban guns because it makes it very easy to kill your neighbor? No, we shouldn't. And so I just think it's a, it's a tough, it, it, you can't put the blame at the feet of a system that has allowed human flourishing because people have also used it for uh, sin. And so that that's kind of, I think that would be my, my kind of basic answer is it's not at the fault of advanced technology, advanced freedom that people are using it to also advance evil because they're using it to advance good as well. I mean, right now we're using technology that's used by porn peddlers to push porn. People would not be listening to us and watching us now if we didn't have this technology, but also people wouldn't be watching porn on the internet right now if it wasn't for this technology. So is the internet technology evil? I'd say no. Uh, I do think though it, it allows, for, what it does is it amplifies the ability to do good in something like this, but also the ability to do evil like porn. Gross. Awesome. Thanks for feeling that objection. So let's talk about Catholic teaching. Right. Um, so the, and this will get into another big objection. So yeah, go ahead. Um. Okay, so Catholic teaching. Here's where I know a lot of, uh, particularly traditional Catholics, and I I call myself traditional Catholic. Uh, it's kind of funny because just an aside, for years I, I believe in libertarian principles. I didn't want to call myself a libertarian because I didn't want to get lumped in with the libertarians. I also believe in traditional Catholic principles, but I didn't want to call myself a traditionalist because I didn't want to get lumped in with them either. And I kind of realized I got to stop worrying about what people think about me and worry about, you know, worry about like how people, what groups they perceive me in and just not care about that. And so, but a lot of traditional Catholics, and I said, I consider myself one, they take exception to uh, Catholics who say they're libertarian. And by the way, Tom Woods, who's probably the most prominent Catholic libertarian in, on the planet, He's a traditional Catholic. Uh, they would argue that it is contrary to Catholic teaching. And I think a, a couple things. The first one is we have to get back to basic principles. Where does the church have, a, what does the church have authority over? And what is the church's sphere of authority? I actually have an article coming out, I think this week at Crisis Magazine about spheres of authority and how we all are under authorities, various authorities, but what that authority has the right to demand of us differs depending on who we are and what state of light we're in, who our superiors are and things like that. And so what is the church's sphere of authority when it comes to, for example, political systems? And I would argue that 
number one, first, we have to always remember that the church obviously has authority in faith and morals. And it can teach infallibly in faith and morals. Generally, where it touches political systems is morality. And so it does have, the church does have authority in, in, over morality, defining morality and preaching morality. And so therefore it does have an impact on politics. I don't, I'm not saying the church has no authority whatsoever to speak on anything political. However, what I would argue is that the church has an authority to give principles, to mark out what are the principles by which we are to live. But it does not have the authority to prescribe specific systems because it just simply doesn't have that competence. It would be like a uh, doctor telling you how to properly uh, hunt. I mean, maybe he's a good hunter, maybe he's not. But the point is, as a doctor, he has no authority to tell you how to go out and hunt properly, hunt deer or whatever. And so a pope may at some point say he thinks system A is the best for principle B. But actually, we might find that system C is the best for principle B. If that's the case, you don't have to accept system A just because the Pope said system A is the best. Because what he's really saying is, is it's the best for principle B, and principle B is what you have to accept. So, for example, when... A, the church says, the Pope says something about uh, systems should be in place for families to be able to, fathers, you know, to support their families. That's a true principle that we have to accept. It would be pagan to think, to, to argue for a system in which fathers could not support their families, for example. But how that is best done, the system in place, the political and economic system in place to make that happen, the church, the Pope or church officials can give their opinion of what they think is the best way to do that, but we're under no obligation as Catholics to abide by that. And let me give you a couple examples. I've noticed that in most arguments with uh, Catholics who are very anti-libertarianism, traditional Catholics, is they seem to take papal statements from about the late 19th century to about the middle of the 20th century, and they make those the guiding, infallible, and immutable uh, systems that we have to embrace. But I notice at the same time they, they ignore other papal teachings, for example, on, on economic issues and political systems. For example, Pope Paul VI in 1967 wrote uh, Populorum Progressio, which is just an embarrassment of an encyclical from an economic standpoint. He was basically giving out guidelines for how third, world's, uh, third world countries should be supported and how they could flourish. Every one of them was just standard textbook 1960s bad politics. And they've all been proven to be disasters. There's nothing... Uh, against the Catholic faith. I don't feel like less of a Catholic or an unfaithful Catholic because I'm basically saying that Pope Paul VI's economic and political uh, ideas in that encyclical are completely wrong and, and, and been proven to be disasters. More recently, we could look at Pope Francis's uh, Laudato Si, yeah, Laudato Si, and say he gives some different ideas in there, which frankly are awful political and economic ideas, they're just awful for care of an environment. And so if it's really true that somebody, when somebody gives me a, a quote from Pope Leo the 13th or, or Pius the 12th, something like that, and says, oh, look, this is endorsing this political system, I'll say, okay, then if that's, we have to abide by that, why don't we have to abide by what Pope Paul VI says or what Francis says? I think it's a little bit of inconsistency. Now, this is not cafeteria Catholicism in the sense that, oh, we just don't like what a pope is saying and so we disregard it. What it is, is it's using our God-given and church-endorsed use of reason and our, our, um, our ability as lay people and our job as lay people to say, okay, what are the best systems to implement the principles that our popes and the, the church is giving us? And here's where 
we have very much room for disagreement. Like, for example, I believe a very limited government, minimal government, libertarian type idea of government is the best system for Catholic principles. However, I am fully aware of the fact that a Catholic layperson can disagree with me vehemently about that, and they're still a Catholic in standing just like I am, because they're simply saying they think a different system is best for these principles. And so we, we disagree on systems, but we can't disagree on principles. And so I think that's a very important point. In fact, I, I found this quote Pope Leo XIII himself said, and he said, if I were to pronounce on any single, uh, let me start over. If I were to pronounce on any single matter of a prevailing economic problem, I should be interfering with the freedom of men to work out their own affairs. Certain cases must be solved in the domain of facts, case by case as they occur. Men must realize indeed those things, the principles of which have been placed beyond dispute. These things one must lead to the solution of time and experience. The fact is, is over time, we have found that certain systems work better than others. We know, for example, that communism doesn't work. It's a disaster, both because it actually violates many of the principles of Catholicism, but also just practically, it doesn't work. We know that now. Somebody in, let's say, in, in Marx himself, for example, or somebody in the 1850s or might have said, oh, I think this system might be the best one for Catholic principles. And they might have honestly believed that. But in 2020, we know that's not the case. And so in the same way, if a pope of the 19th century, for example, says, I think this system is the best to implement this principle, we're free to say today, no, we found that that system actually isn't the best for that principle. We agree with your principle, Holy Father, but we don't agree with, with the system. And so that's where I really think the, the, the disagreement can come in is, okay, what's the best systems in place? And that's all a libertarian is arguing for is systems not principles of uh, of Catholic teaching. Yeah, I think I think that that's a very good point. In fact, I was just going to bring up that very con quotation that you read. Okay. So that's from Catherine Burton, Leo the Thirteenth, the first modern pope, page one seventy one. He also references John Paul II, Centesimus Anno three and forty three, and Quadresimo Anno forty two, in which Pius the Eleventh says. There are matters of technique for which she, the church, is neither suitably equipped nor endowed by office. Right. And so I, it is very important that you bring up because the laity do rule. We, we are, In this area. It, yeah, we, we are the ones who uh, conduct just wars, for example. I mean, the church may pronounce in certain cases this is a just war, but we do actually wage war. The priests right. do not pick up swords. They're not, uh, St. Thomas says they should not do bloodshed, but we, the laity, should in certain cases, of course, and also ruling uh, and making out the system. So the, the exact intricacies of the system, uh, the church does say again and again in these quotations that there is a certain amount of the systems. Uh, now, on the other hand, because <clears throat> I, I think I like the, the term you're using, system, because that's, I, think, I think that's where it really accords with what you're saying. But there's also the, um, there is also a critique from the same encyclicals. This is from Pius the 11th, Ubi Arcano Dei 61. And he says, many believe in or claim that they believe and hold fast to the church doctrine on such questions on social authority. And he mentions then Leo the 13th, Pius the 10th, Benedict the 15th. And he says that there are, there are those who rebel against them and says, he says, quote, there is a species of moral, legal, and social modernism, which we condemn no less decidedly than we condemn theological modernism. And Ferrer also brings up, there's a quote where Pius X sort of says the same thing about rerum novarum in particular, um, because I think when it becomes the difficulty with when we, I think I, I, I think I like the term system, but then when we talk about morals, and this is where it gets difficult because Mises and Rothbard both sort of assert that the market in some sense is sort of amoral. It's sort of a, a group of human choices, which the sum of which is sort of an amoral thing. Whereas bef like a, a, an individual human choice is a moral action. It's, it's morally good, bad, or neutral, whatever. And the church can pronounce on that and can say that mor that is a moral. The church can have a moral say in that. But the, the, the claim of the Austrians, as I understand it, is that when you add all those things up, 
to some of those is an amoral thing. And now the church cannot pronounce a judgment on that. To me, that that doesn't that strikes me as a philosophical error because you can't say two plus two equals not four. It equals you know something different and something of the, of a different substance than that. So I think the difficulty happens when the church is saying, like in these other quotations, I'm saying they're saying, well, there are certain moral, there are certain parts of economy that are still moral questions that which which the church says we still can pronounce on. So that's that's a bit. That's the objection. And I think I would I would argue that the market is amoral, but I would un, I would make sure we understand it properly. What that means is, is that the ability to make choices in a free market, that ability is amoral. What we do with it, the actual choices we make are either moral or immoral. And to go back to the example I gave before, somebody watching this this uh, video cast right now, that is, uh, it's a great moral choice, but no, it's, it's not, it's obviously not immoral and it's, it's moral in the sense that they're trying to learn more about what the church teaches and what, uh, how to help people, things like that. But if another person's on another video site watching porn, using the exact same technology that the market has given them, they are making an immoral choice that will uh, harm their soul eternally, potentially. And so in that sense, the internet, for example, is amoral, yet we all know that the internet is used a great deal for immoral purposes. And so the free market is amoral in the sense that giving people the ability to make choices in and of itself is not moral. For example, some even use, I mean, some, some technologies, for example, can be used more for evil than for good. For example, a nuclear bomb. That is something that I would still argue in and of itself is not immoral. It's amoral because somebody could develop one simply to protect their citizens through threat of it being existing from attack. Yet, obviously, if you bomb and I, just to, for people who disagree with what I'm about to say, too bad. If you bomb a city like Hiroshima and kill innocent citizens, that's an immoral action that you did with that. But the existence of that nuclear bomb wasn't moral or immoral. And so the, the ability to choose whether or not to bomb somebody is not amoral or immoral. In fact, the ability to choose is fundamental to human to the human being. I mean, the human soul has an intellect and a will, and that intellect gives them the ability to know right and wrong. It gives them the ability to choose, which is what the will does. And so in a sense, the ability to choose is actually a moral thing. It's, it's just fundamental who, to who we are, that we have to be able to choose. And so a government, a market, allowing people to make those choices can't in and of itself be immoral because obviously, first of all, every single government always gives their citizens the ability to choose some things. I mean, maybe communist Russia, Soviet Union was the was the least able, but they even they were able to make certain choices. And so all the libertarian is saying is, is like, we want to give people more ability to make these choices. And then as a Catholic, I'm saying, I want those, I want to evangelize those people to make the right choices, make moral choices. But I, I want them to have the ability to make those choices uh, or the government to stay out of it, so to speak. But then the, the people should, the, and the church should be promoting good choices as, as much as possible. Right on. Now, I, I forgot to bring up the crony capitalism yeah. distinction between, because I, I, I think, uh, and uh, a lot of people bring up the objection that, well, the big, you know, let the free market go. Then you just have these big corporations who have so much international power that they're able to just make the governments do their bidding and then create favorable market situations for themselves. Uh, but you you said to me previously that that's uh, you would condemn that as well as, as, as the corruption of the free market. Can you speak more to that, too? Well, let's just use the example of the 2008 uh, recession. That was a classic example of crony capitalism where what was happening is the government was promoting, pushing and, and prodding, for example, banks to make loans that were not good ideas, that were, uh, that were terrible ideas, but they were giving them incentives to do it. And then when the whole thing collapsed, 
they bailed them out. They bailed out the banks, they bailed out Wall Street. And so that's the government running and controlling the economy. Whereas, for example, if I would strongly argue that if a company, I don't care how big it is, makes decisions that cause it to go bankrupt, they should be allowed to go bankrupt and die so that lessons can be learned. And so the next company that takes over that market or is part of that market realizes I can't make those choices anymore because what will happen is I'm going to collapse like they did. And so what it, crony capitalism, what it does is it's the government incentivizing companies to act in a certain way. And it, it, it creates moral hazards. It creates them basically deciding to make decisions that are not good that that harm harm uh, that are not good business sense. Like for example, giving a loan out to somebody who should not have a loan. I remember, I'm old enough to remember. I actually remember going for a loan in 2001. So we hadn't got quite to the craziness, but it's still crazy for a mortgage. And they were going to offer me twice as much as I want. I felt comfortable taking because they're just like handing out money like crazy. Because the government was incentivizing them and was protecting them from losses if that loan went bad. What really should happen, though, is a person who runs a bank should say, okay, let's evaluate this person. What is a healthy way to loan out money to this person, potentially, and not be thinking back in my mind, but if it doesn't work out, I always got, I got the federal government to, to bail me out. And so that, that's an, just one example of crony capitalism. But anytime a government favors one company over another for any reason, that's crony capitalism, and I'd condemn that. And so that's and and I think crony capitalism is is very prevalent in America today. I mean, that's basically how things work. If you see the how the fact that when a company gets of any size, what's the first thing they who's the first person they hire? A lobbyist. Because right. they want to make laws in their favor. They want to make sure that the laws go in their favor. And so they want to curry favor with the government and if the government, if there's a true free market, there'd be no need for them to ever hire lobbyists. They just had to survive them, whether or not they satisfied the needs of their customers. And if they didn't, they'd go out of business and they should. And if they did, then they'd be successful and they could grow and they could get very big. And if they got big and they started to not meet the needs of their customers anymore, the customers would be free to go somewhere else. Somebody else could set up. There wouldn't be barriers, to, as many barriers to entry because Often it's the government. I mean, here's here's one example people don't think about too much is, is licensing. I mean, in a lot of places, for example, you have to get a license to, to operate a hair salon from the government. And in a lot of times in poor neighborhoods, this is a barrier to entry for some young person who is uh, economically not doing, you know, they're, they're poor to start to be an entrepreneur and start their own business because they have to go through so many hoops, they have to pay so much money in order to get licensed. Well, the people who support the licensing are the people who are already favored and they're able to afford the licensing. They're already licensed because it's keeping out competition. And studies have shown that licensing does not help people like get better hairstyles or whatever. I mean, they do it also in law and, and, and medical field and all that stuff. But licensing does not actually help. All it does is it, it creates barriers to entry. That's crony capitalism right there is a, a lot of these licensing requirements, keeping people out of the of a market so that the people who are in the market can have a, a, a monopoly enforced by the government instead of just letting somebody – like you can't set up – for example, in a, you can't set up and say, hey, I just want to start uh, doing hairstyling for people in my in my kitchen or something like that. Nope, you're not allowed to do that. But that could be a way that person could build up their business and eventually get their own storefront and all this stuff, but they can't even get started because of these uh, government requirements. Yeah. And I think that is a very good point from the Austrian free market perspective is that entrepreneurship and business making is really what truly alleviates poverty. And that's also, yes. I think the distributors would also agree because they, they're all about the small farmer and owning their right. own business and everything too. So we'd all agree that the poor need to have their own jobs and especially their own businesses, which is the most ideal situation for them. Um, so Eric, let's get into practical libertarianism. We talked a little bit about era of the, you know, the COVID-1984 and everything. Um, 
but tell us more about what have we already explained what you mean well, by practical? A lot, a lot of it we have, but what I, I just want to mention that a lot of these arguments that I see between libertarians and, and some people who believe it's against Catholic social teaching or they're very much against maybe the Catholic encyclicals of the 19th and early 20th century, I feel like that's a nice discussion maybe to have in the ivory tower, but what year are we living in? The fact is we are living in an era in which government is giving itself more and more power, and these are secular and anti-Christian governments that are doing it. And so if nothing else, I feel like every Catholic should at least be on the side of libertarians when it comes to most practical matters. Even if you don't embrace libertarianism as a principle of uh, how government should run, at least recognize that we're your ally in today in probably about 80 to 90 percent of things the subsidiarity because exactly i mean that's a, that's a primary reason right there we we in my state for example ohio our government since our, our governor i should say since the middle of march and is happening every state just about he just creates mandates every you know every week he creates a new mandate we have to follow and there's zero checks and balances on him. He doesn't have to take it to the legislative branch. He doesn't have to get voted on or anything like that. He, and and, the, and the, the judicial branch just lay, lies down for him. But the idea that we're giving him this authority and he can just do this for indefinitely. I mean, I, I'm willing to admit emergency situations in which some crazy thing happens and for a very short, maybe week or two time period, he has to do certain things to protect citizens. Okay. I, I'm willing to grant that, but it's been four months. We have time for legislature to get together and get, get on a zoom meeting if they have to, whatever, and they can vote on it. They can debate it and make it more open. And also more importantly, I, I, one of the biggest things I thought was crazy about the whole initial COVID response is this call for places like South Dakota to react exactly like Nor New York city. If you've ever been to South Dakota, <laughs> it's nothing like New York City. I have I mean, been to both places. <laughs> right. It, there's nothing, there's no commonality there right. other than people live there. I mean, yeah. there's no, I mean, in New York City, it's a sardine can. All the time you are inside with other people in small enclosed areas, or you're even when you're outside, you're you're packed together. South Dakota, you could go miles without ever seeing anybody. And so the idea that so subsidiarity today would argue very strongly that each state should be able to do what they, they should do. But even lower than that, I would say, like California is way too big to be having a one size fits all, and Ohio is the same way. And so my point is this, is that Catholics really should be on the side of curtailing government. The actual battles we are facing today isn't whether or not, I mean, isn't whether or not contraception, for example, should be illegal because I'm sorry, that's just not a debate today that's, that has anything to do with reality. And so what we should really be thinking of is we should make sure that governments aren't able to shut down churches just because they claim it's for the common good. I mean, if there's one word that's misused by Catholics when it comes to Catholic social teaching, it's that phrase, the common good. Remember, every single dictator claims the common good for every single law he makes. He, Hitler would say killing all the Jews is for the common good. So just saying something that the government has a right to do these things because it's for the common good is not a valid argument because every government claims what they're doing is for the common good. We have to prove that it actually is for the common good, that it actually does help citizens. And so, for example, that's why we should have debates over these things in the legislative branch and stuff like that is are the lockdowns actually for the common good? Maybe they are, but we should have that debate. And so that's why I feel, and of course, COVID is just one example of this, but we have this out of control government. Another area, and I, I bet you I disagree with a lot of uh, conservative Catholics on this, is like, I think American foreign policy is terrible because we're involved in so many different wars, so many different uh, military activities in which innocent people are being killed with no real defense of America or justification under just law. 
These are the type of things that Catholics, I think, should be concerned about in limiting government. And I mean, just Roe v. Wade itself. Talk about fiat by a small group of men. I mean, nine men basically decided by fiat that a woman could kill her child. And it was illegal. It was, I'm sorry, legal in all 50 states. That's insane. And so, like, for example, sometimes I'll argue that I'd be happy if it just went back to the states, because at least then abortion would be illegal in some states. It'd still be legal in others, so it's not ideal, but it's better than what we have now. So like the idea of subsidiary of let's try to get more and more. And so I feel like that's where there's this disconnect. I'm more concerned about today, what's the practical impact? And I really believe that conservative Catholics, politically conservative Catholics, should really have a much more a willingness to do common cause of libertarians on most practical matters because it is the size of government and its ability to, to do things like declare abortion legal in all 50 states that really is a root cause of a lot of the problems we have today. Yeah, I think that's definitely, I, I completely agree. I am I would not identify myself as a libertarian or distributist or anything in particular um, on these questions, but I I certainly see the growth of government in history, like we talked about Henry VIII, and especially the American history where eight out of 13 colonies, states had a, a, a state funded state church, even though it was Protestant, but at least they had a, uh, a Christian culture in some sense, even if it wasn't Catholic. Um, and they, they had the power to regulate their own community and yeah, subsidiarity is completely destroyed by the rise of this international power state. So I, I definitely agree with that as as a very important pressing issue, extremely pressing. It, it is good that tr I know that Trump may have just done this for political expediency, but I'm glad that he put it back on the governors, even though the governors, I mean, some governors get a good job, like South Dakota, yeah. like you said, like, yeah. I mean, they just kind of made their own decision based on their own situation. And then other governors, not so much, but, but, but I, I think that was that it, still it, a good decision. Yeah. Yes. I mean, the funny thing is, of course, I, I'm, I'm not a fan of Trump, never have been at the, yeah, at the same time, I don't suffer from Trump derangement syndrome, which so many people seem to today. And people consider him this tyrant, this terrible like he's basically Hitler, yet he didn't do, he, he, he rightly let states decide what they were going to do in the COVID response. Now, most of the states, I think, made disastrous decisions. But like you said, at least places like South Dakota could say we're going to be free at least. And I do think over time, those things start to have an impact because people start to say, maybe I need to leave my state because how it reacted to this isn't a good thing. And that's a good thing because that's a free market of people being able to move to somewhere better. So maybe we'll see a rise in people living in South Dakota. I don't know what there is to do in South Dakota, but I'm sure it's a beautiful state with, I mean, it's got a governor that that's done a lot, made a lot of right decisions recently. So there, it has that in its favor. So, <laughs> and I, and I do know a lot of people are, we know people are leaving California and New York. I mean, that's been shown that they're leaving in droves. Uh, so, and those are good things. So. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, the biggest question that I see coming out of the chat is the, the issue of pornography. Yes. Um, because I think that it's difficult. I one 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 of the chat, uh, one, one, somebody in the live chat said, I, I really agree with Eric, but how can a Christian nation ever allow the legalization of pornography? One could argue, for example, based on libertarian principles, that pornography is violence against women right. because it's it's really violating women in particular. And it's violating the marriage bed and the conjugal act and matrimony is sacred sacrament. So one could argue that it's violent. So I, I would, think, go ahead. okay, I will say that most libertarians, I would say uh, the majority of libertarians, at least that I know and I've, I've come into contact with, they would argue that uh, there's no reason that pornography should not be legal. Now, my position would be that, first of all, there's a couple of different considerations. One is obviously anything, most pornography is frankly uh, forced. Uh, the, the, the production of it involves uh, sex trafficking, involves women who are not really given a free choice to decide to do it. And so right there, that's, that's violating libertarian principles. And so just that alone 
is something I think would be it'd be very libertarian to say that should be that should be illegal, obviously, because these people are being forced to do things. Obviously, child pornography would be a case of that. And by the way, just a, a quick aside. There is, I do believe, a libertarian, and I at least believe this, that people, children, do not have the right to make free choices unabashedly. A six-year-old shouldn't isn't given some, I think, maybe it was Rothbard went a little crazy on this because he kind of felt like even, a, I'm, I don't want to disparage Rothbard if he wasn't the one who said it. Some libertarian thinker I thought was crazy on this because it was almost like a six-year-old should be able to decide where, do whatever they want. No, absolutely not. Because they don't have the ability to make, they don't have the free will and the ability to make the choices like adults do. And so, yeah, there should be restrictions on that. So obviously a child, even if a, 14 year old girl, for example, theoretically said, yes, I want to be involved in pornography. That could still be illegal because she doesn't have the ability to make that choice. Now, as far as the distribution of it, let's say, let's give the example of the, the theoretical example of a woman who freely chooses to be involved in pornography and a man who freely chooses to uh, consume that pornography. Another issue I would say is, and this is where the drug issue comes up too, because that's a big one with libertarians is drugs, is the impact of addiction and whether or not people are really making a free choice, especially after they have gotten involved in pornography. I mean, everybody who knows anything about pornography knows it is clinically addictive. I mean, it's not just something where it's like, oh, you you, you, you just want to do it more. No, you your brain actually gets rewired. And so you're no longer making free choices. And so advocating for free choices doesn't necessarily mean that you're advocating for pornography because so much of, uh, I mean, the consumption of the legal consumption of pornography, because so much of it is not free choices. But then finally, I would say that ultimately, I think I would argue the same as what you did, is that pornography in and of itself is violence. It is uh, a violence against the woman, even when she freely chooses to accept it. And so I personally would not have a problem with a, even as a libertarian and still consider myself a libertarian, with a state that just said pornography was illegal. Because I feel like it would restrict a violent action, uh, an action that is a violence against a person. Because even a woman who chooses to be involved in pornography they're, they're, they're having, she's having violence committed against her ultimately no so, would you say would you say the Senate Owen Gagliardo says this sort of contraceptive is that a, is that a morally neutral technology that's sort of a uh, would you also consider that to be violence as well I would not uh, I mean I think it depends on the type of contraceptive method uh, most contraceptives, I mean, the, the, the purpose of them is to prevent conception, so therefore that's an immoral act. Uh, I would argue, though, that in real in the real world, real life, making contraception illegal would be very low on my list of even thoughts because, like St. Thomas's prostitution, I just don't think it's something that it, it's just a state of our fallen world that those type of things would be um, allowed and should not be made illegal. I, I personally don't think that. Obviously, I would think the church should condemn it. Uh, Catholics should not practice it. Catholics should do everything they can to show people why the use of contraception is immoral. But I think that's one of those examples where I do think it's immoral. I think it, and I think it's harmful for the soul. Obviously, somebody who uses contraception knowingly and willingly, uh, that's a mortal sin that can lead them to hell. But I don't necessarily think the state should be involved in uh, making that illegal. Uh, right. Because I, sure. I don't think I don't think that's quite the violence that I would consider um, somebody like something like pornography to be. Yeah, Sean Morrissey brings up Rothbard and Mises. They're both agnostic Jews, and they mock Christianity. And like you said, they promote things like gay marriage or um, I don't know if both of them promoted abor abortion or not, but. They do. I know. I know Rothbard. Things, right? I know Rothbard himself. Uh, in one of his, uh, it's a great book in so many ways. He argues that abortion should be legal, uh, and he has a very strange argument for it. So yes, I, I, yeah, I don't know so, about Mises, but I right. Know more so about I, I think that does. one thing that gives, it should give anybody pause, is if you have 
a non-Christian, especially a Jew who explicitly denies Jesus Christ, not just sort of a pagan who doesn't know anything about Jesus Christ, but you have a Jew who denies Jesus Christ or is just an atheist and then mocks Christianity, does that not bode well for their darkened intellect to understand these economic laws that they're asserting? Does that give you pause? It doesn't, honestly, because it wouldn't give me any more pause than if I found out that some uh, great math equation had been solved by an agnostic Jew or somebody who was antithetical to Christianity, because I think what it is, is it's, they're simply observing how people act in the world. And I don't think you need to be Catholic to observe how people act. They're not making a, in their economic analysis, they're not making a uh, argument for or against that action, whether or not it should be more, it is more or not more. They're just simply saying, this is how people act. People make choices based upon the, uh, their, their own self good. I mean, that, that's something we all know that, for example, we make choices that we think are good and we value some things more than others that the rational human being, for example, values $100 more than he values $90. It doesn't take a Catholic to argue for that, to, to prove that. And so I have absolutely no problem with uh, people who come up with economic, uh, understand, uh, explain, I should say, economic laws. I would say economic laws are just simply how, it's like the laws of physics. It's just how things are. And they're simply explaining how things are. And then we have to develop systems that take in consideration those economic laws. And so just like the person who designs the airplane is taking consideration the laws of gravity when he designs his airplane. If he doesn't really understand gra the laws of gravity, his airplane isn't going to work too well. Likewise, the political uh, theorist who comes up with political systems based on economic laws, has to understand those economic laws properly in order to have good systems that work with it. And so somebody like a Rothbard or a Mises, who is simply explaining the, those economic laws, like a scientist might explain the laws of gravity, I don't really care if they are Catholic or not, because I don't think that is a necessary part of the equation. Now, just so be clear, though, Rothbard's argument for abortion is ridiculous. Yeah, certainly. <laughs> but that's um, he's going beyond... There he's, there he's being a political theorist. He's not explaining an economic law when he says that abortion should be legal. Then he, now he's saying in a political system, abortion should be legal. And so that, that's, that, that's a whole different, now he's moving into a different area. And that's, that's one thing that can be confusing too is popes do this, but also some of these people like a Rothbard or a Mises do it as well, where they will be explaining economic laws at some points and other times they're advocating for certain political systems. And those are two different, Things. Same thing with popes. When they write, they might talk about political philo um, principles or principles of living, and then they, they segue into political systems to support those principles. And we have to be able to realize that the principles we support, the systems we may or may not, depending on if we think they're best for the principles. Yeah, that, that's that's good because certainly we, we could admit that non-Catholics or Jews or Satanists themselves can discover that two plus two equals four. And you don't right. need to be in sanctifying grace to understand that. Right. Um, and the the assertion of Rothbard and Mises is that the economic laws that they assert are a priori, which yes. means what that means is that they're not empirical. So an empirical, just for the viewers, an empirical is that's when we talk about physics, where you could observe that the you know common law of gravity, the common descent or acceleration of gravity, or whatever you can observe these things, you can test them and you can see that they're always the case. But the economic laws that the, are asserted by these these thinkers are basically just a logical deduction, which they make, like you said, uh, a man, human action. I think it was Rothbard. I can't remember who it was. Mises or Rothbard who said that his, his fundamental axiom is that human beings act on purpose. They, right. they act for a reason and we can sort of make logical deductions from that. The difficulty is that trying to translate that into empirical data because you're saying it can't be proven. It's sort of assumed first. Um, and so the logic needs to be sound. Uh, and that's where the difficulty becomes something because the logic can be disputed. Yes. Uh, but obviously the Austrians assert that it cannot be, but that's the, that's the whole dispute right there. It, right. It's, it's sort of on a well, philosophical obviously, level. Obviously it can be disputed, but 
I would just say that what you're, because obviously anything would be disputed, but I do think by the way, Murphy's book, Choice, Cooperation, Enterprise, and Human Action, that explains, because basically this is the, uh, Mises' is Human Action is what really gets into this, but that book is like almost unreadable for the average person. This is more of an intermediate level, so it's not a super basic level, but it gets into just the ideas of how we value things and how we make our decisions, how human beings make decisions, because we make decisions in the same way. We don't decide for the same things, but we make decisions in the same way, in the sense of, for example, a person who decides to give all their money to the poor uses the same way of making that decision as somebody who decides they are going to uh, become a billionaire or something like that. Although they're different decisions, what they're doing is they're choosing certain goods or they're, they're denying themselves certain things for now for future, um, a future good, all these type of things are all part of just human action. And so that's where I don't think you need to be a uh, practicing Catholic in order to understand those things. That's, that's part of the natural law, so to speak. Awesome. I'm going to, here's our, here's another good question that a lot of people have asked about is how does the social kingship of Christ have a place in libertarianism? Sounds like the social reign of man. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I love that one because I think this is really where I see a lot of the arguments against libertarianism is uh, the, the the kingship of the social kingship of Christ. And I do think I, I do see the common way in people understand the kingship of Christ in the Catholic sense does seem to be contrary to a lot of what libertarians would argue for. But what I would say is is that a political system a limited government political system is not contrary to a society that has a social kingship of Christ. So, for example, a libertarian system, a city, like for, here's an example, Ave Maria, Florida, when it was set up, one of the things it wanted to do was uh, not allow um, contraceptives to be sold in the town. And I, I think I'm getting this correct, but it doesn't really matter that much for example. But essentially what happened was the county or the government or the state or something basically said you can't do that. But a libertarian would say if, if that community voluntarily chooses that they don't want contraceptives sold in their community because th th that, that would be completely fine. There's nothing wrong with that. And that would be an example in my mind of a community choosing for the social kingship of Christ, that they're choosing that they do not want these type of things that are contrary to Christ, to Christian doctrine, Christian morality, to be in their community. And so I would say a social kingship of Christ is can be accomplished and is better accomplished through a voluntary choice of a community to make Christ the king. And so, and then, so they make things so that all the businesses, for example, don't sell contraceptive. And the community doesn't do, and if some, let's say a new business comes in and says, we're gonna start selling contraceptive. And the community says, no, we're not gonna do business with you then. And they boycott them. Well, then he goes out of business. And now there's no business again, selling contraceptive in, contraceptives in that community. And there was no law passed. There was no violence enforced to make that happen. That was simply a matter of the community choosing to, make Christ king, the social king by, and that's just, of course, one example, the contraceptive, but that's one example. So I don't think a social kingship of Christ is contrary to a very limited government, I guess is the best way to put it. Awesome. Well, Eric, thanks so much for coming on and providing your viewpoint on this. Any final words on the subject? I mean, not really. I, I think the, the, well, okay. I, I will say this, that and I told you this in a text uh, before the show, Tim, and that is I view my libertarian views very much as my personal opinions that I do believe are in keeping with the infallible teachings of Holy Mother Church. I, if, I if I thought for a second that any, that any of my political views contradicted the teachings of, of, of the magisterium, the infallible teachings of the magisterium, I would, I would disavow them immediately. And so I am happy and I like disagreeing with debating, I should say, with people about different political systems, what's best. I just simply do not accept the idea 
that there is a one specific Catholic form of government, a one specific Catholic uh, system of government, I should say, that you have to accept if you're Catholic. And that's where I just feel like we should not go down that path because uh, Father James Martin does that when he says we have to follow the dato C of Pope Francis to the letter. We have to be everything the Democratic Party seems to want. We have to accept or we're not pro-life, according to Father, we're not really Catholic, according to Father James Martin. I don't see that being any different than the Catholic who says we have to accept all the political systems of Leo the 13th or Pius XI or whatever. I think they're, they're two sides of the same coin. But I do think, so I think we should be more free to debate these things, uh, things that we're allowed to debate that the laity is actually charged with. And so I'm very much, there's no debate when it comes to Catholic principles among Catholics, there shouldn't be. But when it comes to political systems, I think we should all be free to, uh, to disagree and to debate and try to decide what is the best form uh, and system of government that will allow Holy Mother Church, frankly, to uh, preach the gospel to all the nations. Absolutely. Yeah. So we'll continue to talk on the show about where is that, where is the the gray area? Because many would argue that your your position is not in the gray area. It's right. in the forbidden area, but others would say, well, it's still the gray area. So it's, it's, we got the gray areas debated as to how much gray there even is where we can right. even yeah. disagree. Uh, so I would say the gray area is a lot bigger than a lot of people think. Right. Right. Yeah, think so. yeah. Definitely. I, I think that's something that c comes with age and experience sometimes. <laughs> a lot of yeah. gray. I mean, I, I know that I, yeah. when I was 15, everything was black and white. But, Absolutely. Yes. Uh, yeah. I could see a lot more gray in a lot of things. But And I was always right on everything when I was. Oh, there. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So coming up, like I said, we'll, we'll talk more of the sort of distributed side of things on Friday. And then we will have a debate on this subject in the future. I'm still working that out. So stay tuned. In the meantime, you can check out Eric Salmon's work at the link below, ericsalmons.com. And how's the book going, by the way? It's it's cool. I'm actually I'm feeling better about it than I was about a month ago. COVID actually hit me hard when it got locked down because I was doing all my work at the public library. Oh yeah. And right. also when that shut down, I had a hard time adjusting. I mean, I work from home normally, but I was doing my book at the library because I felt like I could really focus. Oh yeah. But I've adjusted and I'm I'm kicking it out, so uh, hopefully it'll be Great. turned in on time. <laughs> well, we'll definitely have you on to talk about your book when I'd love that when the time comes. All right, man. Well, so let, let's uh, pray on our Father. Let's offer up, especially for the poor. And yes, when we we always want to remember the poor and the vulnerable because that's the first concern we should have after our family of an economic system and especially Absolutely. in COVID 1984 people are losing their jobs i just yeah. saw the headline that the unemployment benefits and we could disagree about that but we, we can't disagree that people are going to be hurt by that you know just, yes um you know in, in this situation when they when they're really forced out of work and they can't find these jobs because people are closing right. on everything so it's a very difficult situation for many families right now so remember to help your neighbor know your neighbors especially Amen. the elderly who are in need and can't get around as easy as you can so Let's pray for the poor and help the poor. And let's pray especially that Catholics can work these things out and and as much as possible bring the justice for the poor and for man in their communities. Amen. So, in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost, amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.